Monica, I think it's time for us to kickstart the program. Uh, we are 50 participants and I'm glad to see people from all over the world, even China. Karibu, Mabimi Nababwana, as we say in East Africa. Um, I'll let Monica take it from here. Okay, yeah. So I'd like to share the, the screen, people. Or you'll run it for me. Okay, yeah, so. So welcome everybody. And um, this is the a pre-conference training or a pre-conference tra uh, workshop for the RIC 2021. That is a RCMRD International Conference. And we are glad to have you join us from wherever you are joining us from all over the world. And uh, us as Easter, Esri Eastern Africa, we are so glad to join uh, RCMRD in this uh, conference. But for this session, uh, we will be doing a pre-conference uh, pre conference session. So we are glad to welcome you and feel free to learn and interact in this session. So, um, if you can take me to the next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, you are uh, joining us from different backgrounds, from different nationalities, different disciplines and interests, different organizations. I know we have uh, GIS users, but also we have uh, field, uh, teachers, we have scientists from different sectors. We have people working in governments and also working in uh, NGOs world. We have uh, guys from different uh, organizations from uh, also other nationalities from uh, uh, the government section and also uh, for, from business as well. We are welcoming you. And we know that today we will study together to create a, a, a good uh, community for all of us. We thank you also for joining us uh, today to form a global community of GIS professionals. And we are sure that you will be able to benefit from this session and you feel free to ask questions and type the same on the chat section. So the purpose of uh, this, uh, okay, we have different, uh, I have several team members joining with me today. And number one is uh, Sydney Nyongeza, who is uh, a solutions engineer representing the natural resources industry. And I also have Biko Olali, the industry manager at the utilities and telecoms uh, industry. And myself is Monica Monzia. I'm the industry lead uh, for water utilities at S3 Southern Africa. So today we have um, uh, a, a, a small, um, okay, we have sessions and this is our, our program for the day. So we'll start by welcoming you. A welcome remark from S3 Eastern Africa by Biko Olale. And then from there, we will uh, have Kenya Water Towers, which is one of our key customers uh, showcasing uh, on integrated monitoring and uh, system for sustainable management of water towers in Kenya. From there, next will be complete GIS for water resources manager, management by S3 Eastern Africa. And also we'll have, um, another customer called Codio East Africa, showcasing on enhancing coastal and marine resilience. And this will be from Western India, uh, Indian Ocean. And then we will also have a question and answer session whereby you'll be free to, to ask uh, and also to type whatever you feel you need to, to know more or even uh, feel free to interact and even give uh, answers. And now from there, we'll have a closing re remarks. So um, I welcome you once again and let Biko take over from here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Monica, for that introduction. <laughs> I hope everyone is feeling warm wherever they are. In Nairobi, it's quite chilly this afternoon. So I hope uh, you guys are paying attention and you'll be able to keep up with this exciting program that we have for you. 
So without further ado, um, I'd just like to quickly get into the first part, which is it'll be mainly introducing you to the work we are doing as Esri um, and how we've been able to support um, the global community of, of, of GIS experts uh, that we've seen. Um, so the work that we've seen happening around the world is quite extraordinary, um, both in breadth and uh, magnitude, because we've seen people from all over the world addressing virtually every big issue that our world is facing, from energy to environment, to climate change, to even modernizing cities, um, now that we have to keep up with, with all the changes that are happening in our world. Um, and I will showcase some of these examples um, in the next slides in line with the theme of, 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 of this conference. Um, in the environmental monitoring and assessment side, we've seen a lot of work happening um, from clients all over the world. Um, if you look in the upper left, we have uh, people like the Wilson Biodiversity Foundation mapping the biodiversity for the entire planet. Other users are working on even looking at the footprint of human beings, um, like in Canada, and even monitoring things like uh, sea ice, now that we have global warming, warming which is an uh, ever-present threat right now. And even other applications around water quality modeling and even monitoring groundwater on the bottom right of the screen. And if you look further into even the natural resources management, um, which is also a very key speciality of ESRI in terms of the solution we're offering, um, we've seen lots of customers advancing and using GIS to really solve some, some of the problems and challenges that they're facing within that sector. Uh, we have things like uh, assessing suitable farming patterns in Brazil, for example, in the top left. In forestry, we have seen um, this forestry organization modernizing. We have the likes of Kenya Forest Service, who recently won the Special Achievement in GIS Awards at ESRI, who have really pioneered the solutions that they are adopting using GIS. We have applications as well within the land information side because all this ties down to how do we um, make our arts more sustainable? How do we make sure that um, the solutions we are adopting help us achieve the sustainability that we want? And we've seen some of our users using GIS to manage land information, land parcels, and um, our solutions come with these capabilities inherently embedded in them. In uh, the water sector as well, we've seen lots of innovation uh, happening in the recent uh, past and ArcGIS has really um, put a lot of uh, research and development investment in, in this sector because uh, for water and water and uh, wastewater management agencies around the world, GIS is now a key pillar for things like asset management where they're able to support service orders or manage uh, inspections in ways that before were never thought possible. Uh, with the real-time uh, field-to-office workflows that are embedded within the ArcGIS platform. And the examples on the left is looking at the analytics that you can be able to derive from the, from the system, where you're even to, able to analyze where investments should be made within uh, a certain water network or a sewer network, uh, because you're able to analyze from a spatial perspective and see exactly where in your network, um, you know, based on the patterns and trends that you've monitored, um, is really causing, you know, the, the, the most severe of effects for, for the organization. In the area of disaster preparation and response, um, in line with the theme of, of, of this RICS uh, conference, we've seen uh, GIS really um, coming in strongly and it has had a long history in the field of disaster preparedness, um, where we've seen examples of how um, it has modernized some of the workflows that they were there before. Um, there's an example here of Congo, uh, where you're looking at ground deformation near a volcano. Um, but whether it's real-time fire um, assessments or doing assessments for flooding and severe weather, GIS is really playing a significant role right now around the world in, in solving um, some of these challenges and helping communities respond uh, and also adapt after um, the disaster happens. In the area of imagery and remote sensing, um, we've seen significant and it's, it, it, JS is, is, is slowly infiltrating and benefiting a lot of workflows in these areas from understanding forest inventory using satellite um, imagery. Um, and also to back to the example I gave of even the Kenya Forest Service here, who and, and other examples of how you can visualize even vegetation health 
imagery is really coming in strongly um, because of the power that the ArcGIS system uh, is able to unlock within this uh, particular sector. Um, and there are lots of examples of this. So these examples are basically uh, uh, we're showing you because it's in line with the theme of, of, of this conference. And our vision is essentially how, do, how does GIS play a key role in creating a sustainable future? Because we've seen um, a lack of understanding of our reality because there are so many challenges that we're facing globally and our society is constantly facing. And our future depends on how we're able to create and apply this common understanding. Right, And with this complex and ever-changing um, challenges that are always evolving, more is demanded from us um, you know, as uh, experts in the various fields. We, we see that GIS can help you even understand the world better for you to be able to respond accordingly. And these challenges, as I've mentioned, they, have, they range from, you know, forest fires that we're seeing happening now. We have the natural disasters, pandemics. Uh, we're seeing the rapid growth of, of our cities and uh, the effects of how that constrains um, some of our water sources and, and, and other really key sources for, for our survival of our communities. So we're all collectively responsible for even things like ecological stability um, and reducing pollution because we all suffer from these challenges as, as a global society. So creating a sustainable future for us and as Esri, we see it as very possible because it dramatically um, requires a change of priorities to be able to understand how can we prioritize and apply some of the solutions we have to create this better future, to create this, you know, more sustainable future. How do we scale back, you know, consumption? How do we restore some of the ecosystems that have been, um, you know, corrupted or create sustainable agriculture? All the other five themes of um, the RIG conference are very much in line with what um, GIS and even ESRI as a company is focusing on, which is just applying our best science, our best technology, and our best creative thinking um, to solve some of these problems um, using a geospatial platform like ArcGIS. So we see sustainability as requiring um, geography because geography brings everything together. You know, it provides a common language you know, a common approach for us to tackle some of these challenges. And sustainable sustainability requires that we see the world as one single ecosystem. Uh, and geography, as we know, is the science of our world. It provides the science and the language to support this effort. Um, it helps us organize and integrate all environmental factors like biodiversity, um, and ecosystem services and integrate them um, with economic systems even. Um, you know, to specially see these connections happening. It allows us to integrate them with social factors, you know, which are a key contributor now that you have to factor in going forward and provides you with a framework for understanding and applying this knowledge. So this geographic approach um, that we call Azezri is a way of thinking and problem solving that integrates geographic science and formation into how we understand and manage our planet. It's a holistic approach. It brings science together. It's completely integrated uh, and it supports and is en enriched by the spatial understanding um, that we're creating. You know, and the whole concept of collaboration is at the heart of, of, of what we, we are offering and what we see as the key enabler going forward. And having this inclusivity gives us this great vision, you know, that this will impact virtually every sector of our society going forward. And we've seen the approach of integrating as, as, as a powerful methodology because it has resulted to various new capabilities from geoanalytics, um, you know, which is just deriving insights and understanding from uh, all this data that we have to geovisualizations, you know, which is a language through maps and visualization for communicating um, the content and the context of, of, of you know, whatever is your area of interest. Um, this concept of geocollaboration, uh, we will be showing you what we offer as ArcGIS Hubs, which is enabling organizations to engage with, with all their stakeholders. Um, we have concepts like geo-accounting, you know, which is being able to account for all the factors, you know, setting up balanced measures that are not only financial driven, you know, but also considered other factors. 
So these are all critical and the JS community already is contributing to this work. And we'll be seeing some examples like Monica mentioned of Kenya Water Towers and Code East Africa who are already doing this. So clearly GIS is enabling the geographic approach, you know, uh, the very tools we use for measuring and visualizing and analyzing and even making predictions and planning and making decisions. They're all based on, on, on GIS and GIS and the geographic approach provide this framework for applying this integrated uh, geographic knowledge widely. So you as GIS professionals, as I mentioned, you're already uh, doing this and creating many solutions for, for what will be a sustainable future, you know, from protecting uh, biodiversity to reducing the use of, you know, precious resources and managing and monitoring them, uh, whether it's even optimizing logistics and managing um, sustainable agriculture and forests. However, we, we clearly, we need to scale up these efforts. Um, exponentially if we're able to if you're going to be able to really keep up with what is happening around the world <clears throat> and the good thing is that the technology itself is keeping up with all these advancements and we see now GIS being integrated and leveraging many of these other new innovations that we've seen around the world, you know, whether it's enterprise integration with other services uh, on the left hand side, we've seen, you know, lots of innovations happening there from um, even incorporating big data or creating apps, like I mentioned, all these examples are really helping us scale up these efforts. And JS is no longer just a function of basic mapping where you have a simple desktop computer and and then you, all you do is produce um, paper maps, you know, by printing them. Right now it's create, we've been able to innovate and create a geospatial infrastructure, which is connecting and streamlining all the different workflows that were happening before, you know, within disconnected or, you know, siloed uh, departments and creating this, you know, ecosystem where you're able to collaborate and, and have workflows that enable decision making. So this geospatial infrastructure is really transforming organizations and creating a whole new kind of, of, of system, like we'll see some examples of um, later on in, in this session. And the portals, the way they're organized, they're able to now unlock the power of GIS across the organization, you know, unlike before where it was just for specific users or a specific department, you know, and creating these services for all it essentially enables the organizations to really now be able to keep up with all these things that are rapidly changing around its ecosystem. So as I finish, GIS is now becoming another system for sustainability, you know, with all the millions of data sets that are being published and, you know, being produced. Um, they're now able to really understand what is happening and use the data to make decisions, you know, by creating solutions that solve one aspect or another. And we'll be seeing examples of that um, later on in, in this, ex um, you know, session. And by delivering these powerful capabilities through simple applications like dashboards, where you know, you're able to see a complete uh, picture of your organization or have a complete situational awareness of specific tasks or specific projects that are happening on, on, on a simple dashboard, that gives a lot of power to the organization and the decision makers, whether it's providing these capabilities within mobile applications for you know, the field workers to be able to go and engage within their communities or you know, collect data within you know, certain areas. This power is now being given anywhere you know, on, on any device, you know, in almost any time, right? And it's just extending the power of GIS, you know, for, for the users. And we've seen also advancements, you know, in the analytical side where we're trying to derive new insight and understanding from the data that has been visualized. Um, and here, the capabilities are extended in ArcGIS using predictive models that, you know, are, are built into the system and you can be able to develop and extend, uh, whether it's looking at spatial temporal um, data sets or, and, and analytics that come out of that, and even incorporating real-time data uh, from sensors, we're now able to create new insights and understanding from the data that was originally there. 
And in the area of uh, imagery and remote sensing, GIS has really enriched, you know, some of the workflows that were there before. You know, we now provide rich base maps. Um, we have motion imagery capabilities, and and even looking at uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning applications. When you look at um, classification and, and and those types of analytics that come out of um, the imagery. I spoke about hubs earlier and how they're engaging the different types of communities and the hub sites are literally here to provide you with a new way of forming this collaboration of extending the collaboration that you previously had, whether it's within your organization or within your sector or with other organizations. Uh, ArcGIS now offers a hub where you're able to organize, you know, the essentially simple websites where the community, whether it's volunteers, whether it's the professionals, they're able to look at the same data sets that you make publicly available and use that, you know, to inform the activities. As I conclude, our world, as I said, is being challenged on many fronts and we need to collectively, uh, you know, respond for, for us to have this sustainable future. And the geographic approach that I mentioned and the infrastructure that uh, we provide, provides us the science and, and the practical means to act effectively. To create a sustainable future, your work is essential. And we've seen that, you know, in, in various ways, based on the examples I showed earlier. And right now, I want us to see a very practical example of how we've been able to do that in East Africa um, through one of our key clients um, from Kenya Water Towers, represented here by Caroline Wangeshi, who's the senior research officer at the Directorate of Ecosystem Research. So Caroline will be presenting to us what Kenya Water Towers has been embarking on um, with support from various partners. And they've really been able to now take the GIS to the next level um, using portals, uh, using dashboards, and she'll be walking us through how they've been able to achieve that. Caroline, okay. are you there? Yes, I am. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Let me uh, first share. Just a moment. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. I am Caroline Wangashi Murevi. I'm from Kenya Water Towers Agency and our Directorate. Uh, known as Ecosystem Research Planning and Audit. I work there as a senior research officer under the GIS section. Uh, my presentation is, um, of course, just under S3, and, to, and this is in line with how much and intensively we use their softwares and their solutions and products in support of our task at hand. Um, that said, I will be presenting on integrated uh, monitoring systems for sustainable management of water towers in Kenya. So just to start off, I'll start with explaining what water towers is. It's an upland area which comprises of uh, mountains, hills, and plateaus, and whose topology, morphology, geography, and type of soils and vegetation supports reception, retention, infiltration, percolation, and precipitation and acts as the storage for and acts as an underground um, recharger. This water is then released to springs, streams, um, uh, and rivers and swamps and lakes and oceans. Um, just excuse me for a moment. Ah, it's okay. Then uh, next we go to the model that just demonstrates uh, what our water tower is. So we can see from the top left, we see where the headwaters is, where the recharge happens, where there's the precipitation, the rainfall, the snows, and any other form of precipitation that um, flows down and percolates into the soils, infiltrates and percolates to the soils. And also we have surface runoff, which flows to the lower lands where we have settlements, agriculture, and the urban settlers, and all the way to the ocean. So this, this is a model of what we term as a water tower. So Kenya has um, uh, has like a total of 88 water towers that we've identified as Kenya Water Towers Agency. Um, and with that, we have five main water towers, which is uh, which comprise of um, 
Cherengani Hills, Mount Elgon, Mount Kenya, Mau Forest Complex. Uh, and this supply 75% of the water, source, water surface resource that we use in the country. Um, we have 18 gazetted water towers, which are the green dots that you can see on the map. And further, we have 70 water towers that we are proposing for gazettement. Those are the red dots that you can see on the map. So now with these water towers, we, what, has, what is the importance? We have, they contribute a lot to our big four agenda. Our big four agenda for Kenya, it's the blueprint for our uh, Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta, where he wants to support projects that are in line with four pillars, which is uh, food security, to, uh, sorry, food security, health, manufacturing, and uh, housing. So as you can see, most of our water towers, they support heavily in agriculture, manufacturing, um, hydropower, tourism. Um, so you can see the heavy importance that they have on this development project since they provide raw resources for any form of project implementation. Um, that said, we know based to this one turn destruction, based on the uncontrolled um, human activity, Activities. These are the threats that you these water towers face. Like we have on the photos that you can see, we have <clears throat> uh, farming on steep slopes, um, which could lead to uh, degradation, soil erosion, landslides, and and many other, many other destructions. And also, you can see one aspect of clearing vegetation is the deep gullies in Namanga, which is an area here in Kenya. Then also, this is a very recent photo of the forest fires in our mound forest complex here in Kenya. Um, further, we can see these are unsustainable land practices, which you can see this is a sloppy area and we've not enforced uses of um, increased um, agroforestry and use of terraces. This also could lead to a lot of siltation and soil erosion. Equally with the other threats that we have that we know is inv invasive species that are very aggressive and they compete a lot with their natural occurring. Ex, uh, indigenous vegetation. Also charcoal burning here in Kenya is very pro, uh, adamant because uh, that's our source of fuel, the main source of fuel, including firewood. So what are the long impacts of these threats, this destruction that humans cause? One of them is deforestation, I mean desertification. Also um, decline in water quantity and quality. Also we'll have incidences of increased floods and increased um, soil and wind erosion. So all these are things that really affect the country and the world globally in the long run in many years to come. Um, and uh, so what is the, the role of Kenya Water Towers in management of these um, important natural resources? So Kenya Water Towers is mandated to coordinate and oversee and, and uh, oversee the protection, rehabilitation, conservation and sustainable management of these natural resources. And I mean, we have like six main strategic objectives, but in line with this presentation, I'll just focus on three, which is the water tower, which focuses on just three, which is the water tower ecosystem health and re resilience, and uh, also the acquisition of appropriate infrastructure to support sustainable management of water towers. That's where we have um, entities like S3 who really support this endeavor. And also, and we have the third that I'm keen on is the establishment of strategic relationships and linkages for sustainable management of water towers. So with this, we know this is the thing that we need to have, and with this, we need to have information. But we have a lot of information barriers. Why? Why do you have these information barriers? One is that we have, in, I mean, what are these information barriers? So one is the inadequate information on the status. So for us to do any form of restoration, any work, we have to understand where are we right now currently as a country, as a as globally, as a world, as a nation. So also we have in Kenya, what we experience a lot is an uncoordinated approach. Like under the Ministry of Environment, we have many entities doing a certain specific task in the environment, in the ecosystem um, space, but at times we are a bit uncoordinated. Then also we have the lack of interest centralized data platform where we can all have one centralized place where we can acquire all this information from. 
because right now they are scattered in different agencies and at times we have data protection uh, policies that at times make it a bit, a, a bit of a challenge. Also, um, there are no clear mechanisms to share this data. So with existing at times it becomes a challenge because first there's no protocol, no way how to acquire some of this information and it becomes a bit difficult and time consuming. Also, we're limited to the capacity that we have in, in Kenya, and I'm so sure it's so globally, it's a, it's a situation that you'll find in some other countries that you don't have the capacity to monitor this, the status and the health of these water towers. And finally, we have this limited long time monitoring programs so where you can change not only the immediate outputs, but the long term impacts, like 30 years, 20 years from now. So how do we use this um, GIS and remote sensing tools in Kenya Water Towers to help us in this maintenance and sustainable management and restoration of these water towers that are really going through a myriad of threats? So with this, I will also, um, in, I'll, I'll tie it in line with what we do as Kenya Water Towers, but uh, and how we use the GIS and remote sensing. So the first one of the things that we normally do is research and monitoring, because like I've mentioned, we need this information. So with this research and monitoring, that means we're acquiring new information to know what is the current status. And with that, we develop, metas, we develop our status report for each water tower. So for this each water tower, what is it that we do? And acquire or um, analyze under the status report. So in this status report one, what we do, we do the mapping of land cover and land use trends. So with this, how do we go about it? We use a uh, satellite imagery and we use Landsat. Landsat we use it because of the, of the um, <clears throat> temporal resolution that it has. We also use because of its availability and it's, it's cheap, it's free literally. Sentinels, equally we use it for the current so that it can give us the current status of how the water tower is and we prefer it because it has a higher resolution. That said, we also do field work where we do ground truthing um, exercises to know, <clears throat> to actually do like an accuracy assessment of the desktop analysis that we do of the land cover actually using um, random forest uh, method of classification. Then including then what else we actually analyze under the status report is a critical, sorry, is the biodiversity hotspot. With this is where now we work hand in hand with the National Museum of Kenya, who heavily have the expertise to um, check out the, to understand, a better understanding of the flora and fauna of our ecosystem. So with this also, this heavily includes the desktop analysis before going to the field work, do the preparation of the maps and, uh, which we use the ArcGIS software to do the analysis and the preparation of the maps. Then we go to the field where they collect information about all the plant species and animal, insects, and amphibians and reptiles. <clears throat> so then after that also the status reports involves um, the critical, what we do, what we call the critical catchment area. And this is, uh, involves mapping out the rivers and springs and swamps. So in this also initially we start with the we start with the downloading of the DM mostly from Alaska website or using the Asta DM. So this um, we uh, we generate rivers using the hydrology tools in ArcMap, and uh, further we go to the field and walk and we do it's a jointed intercollaborated effort where we work with the. Water Resource Authority, here, that's an agency in Kenya here, yeah. and also the Water Resource Users Association, which is a more ground down to the village person who uses the water. And that's how they help us walk to the ground, and also including the community members. They help us walking to the springs and to the rivers where we collect information in terms of the salinity of the water, the condition, the degradation. And uh, we come back and we map it out. Then when we map it out, you also have tabulated data and uh, stats saying the condition of the river system and the, the critical catchment areas. Um, further, we do something what we call the mapping of degradation levels in water towers. And this hand in hand, we also use the DM, the digital elevation model and the land cover 
uh, map that we created, the current land cover map that we created. This we use um, a tool in our map that is called water um, weighted overlay, which uh, we give different weights to, let's say forest will have weight one, which means it has low levels of degradation and uh, cropland we give a weight of three. Also high areas, high steep slopes, we give them a high rate of three, meaning it is, we, it, there's a high chance of degradation. And with that, we come up with a surface, which you can see just from the screen, it's on the center right hand, just the map on the right hand center. So like you can see where it's a bit orange, all that orange color, that means it's a very high level of degradation. Um, further, what we do is a monitoring, uh, the creation of the, we monitor the water tower status and we use the integrated uh, uh, water tower monitoring system. Here we heavily have, have used the ArcGIS platform where we publish using the ArcGIS online or enterprise. And uh, we, and which is um, pulled out for visualization for common users using our portal. This information, this last point, I will talk a bit more later in the upcoming slides, but that's what we use and that's, and actually it's a work in progress, but we have a prototype. Um, further in the research <clears throat> and monitoring, we have the, we do our water towers planning and audit. And with this, we carry out um, community resource assessment and this heavily uses GPS mobile applications because this, this GIS mobile applications have um, uh, what we call the questionnaires in a digital form. It's simple and easy for the technicians to use and even for the local communities to use. So this community resource assessment mostly is a social economic assessment where they ask um, things about the, uh, what livelihoods they use, how do they depend on these water towers and to what extent. So with that, um, we, and the analysis, we come back and we do helps inform what we call the ecosystem conservation plan. The ecosystem conservation plan, what it entails, it has um, the proposed interventions. Let's say we've cut, it's, an, it's a degraded area. What do we do? Do we, we rehabilitate the galleys? We, the proposed interventions will to be rehabilitate the galleys to do more planting of indigenous trees. And with that, it comes in line with the budget and who, like you can see again on the top right, we can see who's, the, that's the budget and the major stakeholders in Kenya who are involved, both government and non-government. Um, that said, something also that we do, we do the, that heavily uses the GIS and remote sensing is undertaking the total economic valuation of the water towers. So with this, um, this gives the, we've come to realize people need to have an understanding what value these water towers have. Because without attaching a value, people don't see the importance. Like the water it gives has a value. The medicine they give, the food, the, all these have a value. So when you monetize all these, people see indeed they have, there's a lot of value. So with that, we, we do an analysis, which is, uh, which is both uh, social economic and biophysical. So when I say uh, social economic, again, that's, I mean, we go asking for, which is a questionnaire type of form using the mobile app applications. And, and they use these questionnaires and use it for um, and, uh, house interviews, key informant interviews and uh, group focus groups. And this, the questions that they ask is what the number of, what is the number of beneficiaries of these water towers? And what, how do we rank these ecosystem services? Be it provisioning, supporting, cultural or regulatory. <clears throat> Also further, uh, um, also further what we do, we, oh sorry, for, for the biophysical, this entails, for the total economic valuation, this entails the, uh, the, the use of um, measuring the value of plants, the trees, the plant crops that they're there, the fruit trees, the, any form of crops that they use and um, indigenous and even exotic. And at the same time, we, they measure the soil minerals and also do above ground and below ground <coughs> carbon assessment. Um, and so anyway, further, what we do also, 
since we do rehabilitate the areas in conjunction with other agencies, we also audit tree seedlings in rehabilitated sites. And also this is informed by doing a lot of mapping and using the GIS application mobile apps <clears throat> to collect this information and create maps and statistical analysis and have a an narration and, uh, and a conclusion of what is happening and the state of the water towers. So on the state of the rehabilitated trees, are they doing well? Are they Have they died? Do we need to go back and replant? And what is the cause of them not surviving? So and lessons learned. So then further we do, we are actually in the process of um, developing a payment, a PES, which is a payment ecosystem service. This is how do how, how do the communities benefit from this, from sustaining and managing and having and conserving and protecting these water towers. So with that, there are many forms of it and also involves a lot of social economic um, surveys, and we also use uh, heavily the GPS mobile applications. Uh, further, what we do, we protect <clears throat> and do surveillance of the water towers. And a good um, exercise that we do as Kenya Water Towers is the Mau Joint. Mau is our forest, one of our major water towers here in Kenya. So the Mau Forest Joint, the <clears throat> Mau Joint Forest Enforce, the Mau Joint Enforcement, uh, which is a collaborative. Um, uh, component where we have KWS rangers, county uh, rangers, KFS, and other entity that is under the Ministry of Environment, and they help a lot collect information. And we want to push it further to be near real time. But currently, they have GPSs where they collect information in case there's a forest fire, in case they find somewhere people actually cutting trees. All this information is collected and sent to the headquarters, and we process it as maps and uh, graphs and um, in forms of narration analysis. <clears throat> also, we have embarked in uh, boundary demarcation and fencing, especially in Mao. It's one of our startup, and uh, and you can see just far. Off uh, on the right hand side, the map, the red line, the red line that showcases um, our first, uh, that's the 30 kilometer fencing and we've already, it's already in progress and hopefully in future we'll actually get to map. Yeah, so this is the Mau forest where I'm actually showing you where there's a lot of, the pink is a lot of cropland. All this used to be forest and now people were actually, um, uh, it was actually reclaimed, so now that's why the forest, and um, that's why we are actually fencing and a lot of rehabilitation is in process. As you can see, far on the left, the rehabilitation, they like the orange line that um, Kefri, who is the Kenya Forest Research Institute here in Kenya, they were given the, to be the task lead um, to do in 2019 to do the aerial serving as part of using innovative measures to rehabilitate that's more effective and fast but that was their pilot the first pilot so we had to see the results all the other shades it's different entities that have taken in uh, and again what you can see with the subdivision this is again a process that we did before rehabilitation process began we subdivided the whole entire area into blocks of um, of 100 hectares, which will help in management and a reallocation and also in monitoring. So with this, yeah, with this, any person who can can adopt a block and they make sure they rehabilitate. And in this exercise, Kenya Water Tower was the lead, but we were working hand in hand with. Yeah, the point again, all this is the coordinated, coordinating and integrative approach that we are enforcing since we are more of a coordinating and overseeing agency. So further, we also do the water rehab, the water towers rehabilitation, which you can see. We do tree planting, um, spring protection, gully rehabilitation. And with this, all we do at the same, we do mapping of springs, like I told you earlier. We also equally do mapping of the gullies. And from there, they come up with interventions and propose interventions with a specialist on what to do and how to rehabilitate and how to monitor further. So that said, we have collected all this information as Kenya Water Towers. Also, we have other entities, KFS, Kefri. KFS being the Kenya Forests <coughs> Service. They're the ones who are most in conserving and protecting our forest. So we have all this information from different agencies and also from the NGOs. And we want to bring them all together so that we can have one pool integrated system where we can um, 
have all this information that can we can inform an evidence-based decision-making process in terms of restoration and managing. So that's why Kenya Water Towers came up with an integrated water towers management system. So with this, as you can see just from the from the model picture here, like I, I mentioned earlier, we use heavily a lot of satellite data, the DMs and the in the landsats and the sentinels to do a lot of analysis, land cover and hydrology and degradation. Further, we do a lot of field work that you see, we use the GPSs and they equally have mobile application forms that some are S3 and to help in analyzing and collecting information which you can come back and analyze. Equally, down on the down part, you can see we have stakeholders, we are tapping into the stakeholder servers and here we have we have a data protocol where for those who are on board, they've given us like a permission to what degree. Are they giving us raw data? Are they giving us um, already processed data? And to what degree can we share and give access to? But with that, we have a data protocol and where we can access and they're all processed and, uh, and they're pulled into the Kenya Water Tower server. And uh, with that, we have uh, um, a, a I can say a cloud platform because we also have to relate the, the data collected from the field and also some that we have to pull that are mining that are not within our system, like the from <coughs> Global Forest Watch and other entities. And then with that, we have a content management system that pulls in that data and organizes it in a format that is uh, meant to uh, in a format that is now projected visually to the common end users, and this is a web-based portal, which I will show further on how it operates. Usually, it mostly has maps, that, like you can see, and it has a dashboard where it mostly comprises of charts and and pie charts. So, why why did we see the need of this? Like, I'm so sure you kind of I kind of mentioned some of them when I was going through. Like one, that we need. We need to, the system provides an updated, accurate and comprehensive, reliable scientific data that will inform decision makers in any other part, person in, involved in water towers, restoration and sustainable management. Further, we, it, the development of data pro protocols that didn't exist, because we have all these different data scattered in different agencies and organizations, but, but, we, don't, but we don't have a way to share. So that was part of why the water, water towers monitoring system was very paramount. And also <clears throat> to ensure comprehensive and consistent uh, monitoring of these key elements of the natural resource management. And further also to provide, which I've mentioned, a long term way of measuring the impacts of these projects that we implement. If, we have really, if you did rehabilitate plant or um, rehabilitate a gully? Was there an impact? Was your project successful? Did we see the impact and use for it in the long run to the, the direct community, people living around and even for the people who are further living downstream? So that said, the process of making this entail, this system entailed um, 18 institutes and like I've emphasized, our approach is to coordinate and oversee and to enforce integration and coordination. So that's why we needed to, we, we went through with our multi-stakeholder um, different approach and we had 18 institutions, both government and non-government. The technical lead and financial was the World Resource Institute. All these entities that you can see, uh, mostly, government and Kenyan and the rest are NGOs. So the process that was created in creating um, this system was like a first dimension is creating of the technical working group, which has, um, which has, sorry, 18, the 18 members, the 18 members from different, representative from different institutions. And uh, this technical working group, they had a homework and they reviewed the best practices because Technically, we are not the first to do this. The people who've done it, like example, Global Forest Watch and the WRA, WRI. And, and so they went aboard and they did their own research and reviewed what was best and how we can improve, what we can implement and improve. And further, this, this entails now making of the monitoring framework. The monitoring framework, what it has is the objective, the goals, the key goals, 
which has three key goals. And uh, with these goals, how do you measure? So that's the identification of the indicators and the metrics. So the monitoring framework um, informs and guides the monitoring uh, system. So the what and the, the what to measure and the how to measure, that's what the monitoring framework says. So after they, they, they developed a monitoring framework, the monitoring framework was actually validated. And further now came to stage two, which is implementation of the monitoring system. Here, the WRI being the technical, World Research Institute being the technical lead and financial, uh, we had a consultant come, in board, come on board and they helped us develop the content management system, which used the Java and HTML programming language. And uh, that was the back end, um, the one that was now processing all the information that is coming from the geospatial data, which is processed from all the um, ArcGIS um, enterprises, uh, all the ArcGIS platforms from ArcMap to either online or enterprise. Then also from all this data coming from other agencies in form of dashboards so presented out now to the portal using the the charts and the graphs, the, the, yes, the charts and the graphs. So that said, now they had to review, the next step was to review this system and actually integrate the data. And the data that integrated was from two water towers, in, from three water towers in Kenya. So one is the Eastern Mao uh, water tower, which is part of a forest blocking our Mao forest. Um, the main, one of the main, one of our main five water towers, which is a Mao forest complex. Then the second was the Makulin Zawi water tower, which is in a county called Makweni here in Kenya. And the last was the Cherengani Hills, <clears throat> which traverses uh, four counties in Kenya. So that was the data integration that was used for the, for the first prototype. Then they reviewed the prototype and tested it. Then now come to stage three, they went to stakeholders validation where all these 18 agents, institutions that were involved took part. Also, they went to the ground to different counties and involved different stakeholders and also the community, down to the ground of the community to for them to validate this system and approve it. And now we're at stage four, where we need now to present it to the big policy makers and we're still working on that. Then now the final stage is to implement the system. So like I've said now, the but like what I've said initially was the, the monitoring framework is more of a document that has a lot, it guides and uh, informs the, the water tower monitoring system. So all, it's just a document having, stating the goals, stating the indicators, the metrics and the criteria. So this is now what is, is implemented into the water tower, into the water tower monitoring system. The, this is just the, front, the user graphic front, but as you can see, it's a whole system with servers and data collection and satellites and also information from other institutions. But this all information now is just um, uh, projected and visualized in this, uh, in this monitoring, in this portal, which we call the Kenya Water Towers Watch. Um, so, like I've mentioned, we had uh, for in the creation of this water tower monitoring system, we identified three goals, which you can see is improved productivity, and this focuses on the provisioning services. So yeah, the food, the water, the medicine. Then also we have the improved conservation of the ecosystem. So how, how are we going to improve the soil quality, the water quality, increase of biodiversity, the air quality, and now again, what I've, I've really emphasized the integration. So with this, we need the enabling policies and institutional um, arrangements to help facilitate this um, coordinated approach. <clears throat> and uh, like you've heard most of the indicators I'm talking about, the things that this monitoring system monitors or will help monitor. These are a few, like we have the water quantity, what we check and what can be measured is the groundwater levels, the rainfall amount. So in the long run, like 30 years from now, we want, if you are doing a good job, our water quantity, our rainfall will increase. When you go to number two at food, uh, food yield production, yes, we are hoping we'll have better yield because now we'll be doing um, sustainable farming practices. 
so this is um what our um, our our integrated monitoring system looks like so what i showed you earlier was the home page and you have a tab of maps and you also have a tab of the dashboard so when you click on the three on one of the three it will actually go through to the portal but when you look at one of the three areas that we've assessed these are the things that you see like we have the um, on the left side, we have the layers, and they can show you what layers you can see. You can see the overlays, the water tower layers, you can have the land cover, the climate information. And further, this is, this is what you can see. Like for this um, thematic map here, this is the population density that we've actually um, mined from uh, Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. And this is from Kenya Water Towers Land Cover Change Analysis between 1990 and 2016. The green shows what has remained intact as forest. The red shows what we've really destroyed to accommodate farming or settlement. So maybe I can click to the link just to hopefully then my net where I am, my internet is working, is fast enough because it has a lot of uh, heavy graphics. Anyway, as it opens, let me just continue. Then further, I told you we have maps and dashboards. So this is what you expect once you click, once you go to the, to the, to the, to the portal. So you see, it will give you information, like one of the good information that you'll give is the tree cover loss and carbon emissions. And this is all projected as graphs. And this we have sourced out from, um, mined from the uh, Global Forest Watch. Further, we have this, uh, the census statistics from Kenya National Bureau of Statistics here in Kenya. And this is like the number of households in Eastern Mao Water Tower. And you can see the number of households, like this is a location in, um, in Masai Mao called Njoro, and we have like roughly 12,000 number of households. Um, also what it also shows heavily is the land cover composition and the trends. And from the trends, this land cover trends are actually something we've processed as an agency. And here you can see the orange is the cropland and the green is the forest. And you can see they have an interchangeable shape pattern, meaning they're inversely proportional, meaning when the forest was being cut to accommodate farming. So, um, sorry, I will take you through the portal, but since my internet is a bit slow, let's just finish the presentation. Then now the key lessons from everything that we've learned from trying to implement this. So one, we've realized this need for goodwill among institutions providing this data. And that's why we need, hence the emphasis of the integrated approach. And also we've realized we need to develop better algorithms to mine data from different um, sources that are already existing to also save on cost and money. There's no need of us to replicate. And that's why we need an, uh, centralized, uh, um, my, uh, centralized place of accessing data to also avoid duplication and save us a lot of um, costs in these um, endeavors of restoration. And also we need, uh, we realize we need skilled personnel on data science and system development. Because some of these systems really, and that's why now we're, um, entities like S really have come and have really been helpful because also like I've mentioned, we really want to upskill and go to the regions and have near real time data collection. Um, further, um, yes, again, we need better mobile applications where we can do crowdsourcing, which again, now we, same thing, we don't need to keep um, going ourselves to collect this data and some of it already exists. So someone can already relay this information based on how we present it. Then also we need the data sharing guidelines protocols, which we have, but I know it's still a work in progress. And also we've realized we need a win-win strategy for a successful implementation of our integrated watering towers, water towers monitoring system. So as I have said, we're still in the prototype and hopefully we get to get this to win-win strategy. So um, uh, just uh, a moment. 
and to go to our portal. All right. Uh, so hopefully, and I'm sorry in case my internet is not good, but uh, this is how the portal looks like. We have, okay, we have about, which is gives an explanation of what Kenyatta Towers is and our partners. Uh, let me try and do. <clears throat> so our partners, we have Carefree, we have KFS, Kenya Forest Service, so um, Kenya Wildlife Service. All these are the 18 members that uh, were part and part of the implementation of the technical working group. So yeah, you can see these are the people that we heavily used because we really need to have a coordinated approach. And further, um, it gives a background of what Kenya Water Tower is all about and this platform is all about and uh, what we need to be doing and measuring in the long run so that we can have a better approach in monitoring our long-term um, efforts in this uh, sustainable management and restoration of water towers. Um, further, we have now what we have, the critical goals, uh, which I mentioned, the water tower <clears throat> emphasized on, just a moment. Anyway, so our, like I've mentioned earlier, so the concept, the one of the critical goals that we need to look for is the conservation, the production, and the governance. It's something I've already said in my presentation. So uh, with the con production is in line with the uh, provisioning services. The governance is in line with these institutions and the coordinated approach and having better policies in managing inclusive of the data protocols. The conservation is what I've said now, how, what are we going to improve, how our efforts are they going to improve the water quality, the biodiversity? Um, and that said, uh, let me go to the maps. So this is how the maps, this is uh, the three areas that I said we're going to analyze, which is Makulinzawi, Cherengani, and Eastern Mao, that we used for the prototype, the three areas. All these are in Kenya, in different counties. So this is the Cherengani um, water towers. and um, like you can see, once you click on it, the first tab is an information telling you, uh, this map shows you the overview of the Churangani water towers. Then we have the layers. Now, these are the, geo, the, the geospatial data sets. And uh, one of it is the tree, the land cover dynamics, which has all these um, attributes that you can display. And they we heavily mine from the global forest watch. Further, we have the overlays and this one's also come heavily from different institutions, like the county boundaries come from uh, Kenya National Bureau of Statistics. The rivers, some of them we generate as Kenya water towers through the process I told you. And also from uh, Water Resource Authority here in Kenya. National parks, uh, this information we get from Kenya Wildlife Forest. And all this is information that you can see and uh, play with. and. Like, let me try, I don't know if it's been overlaid. Just a moment. Oh, the other thing that I forgot to tell you, um, the portal is actually very interactive. You can zoom in, zoom out, just like I've done, just to see where it is in relation to Kenya and other countries, the surrounding countries in East Africa. Uh, so with that, you can see I've activated the county's boundary. And and yeah, like you can see, when I select, it can, uh, anyway, so you can see, yeah, when I select, it gives you here the information of what county, and you can see Cherengani falls under West Pokot County. Yeah, so you'll forgive me a bit, my internet is slow, so I may be talking too fast for my slow internet, but I'll try, I'll try and slow me down. Uh, so that said, let me go back to the layers. Uh, what else that we can see is the, 
the land cover, eh, sorry, the water towers um, layers. When you say the water towers layers, these are layers that uh, Kenya water towers have actually generated. So these are the sub basins. And all this layer, I think you can, when you move the tab towards on my left side, I'm so sure you can see the casa. So towards on my left side, these are tabs that you can make them uh, visible. When you move to the left, you make them not visible, they're not visible. And when you move all the way to the right, they will activate them. So the springs, I'm so sure we had some few springs on the lower side. Just a moment. Uh, the blue dots, like I mentioned, we usually go to the field and these are uh, actual points that the technical team for Kenyatta Towers walked to and collected information of this using the GPS and a questionnaire where you're filling information about it. If the water is saline, does it have an odor? Is it brown? Is it is the area is the catchment um, uh, uh, well conserved or not? Is it fenced? What are the uh, the interventions that you propose? Do you need it to be to plant more trees, bamboo? Do you need to fence? Do you need to put an intake for the communities to use to avoid contaminating around the the, the springs? So when you go here to the springs to make to deactivate them, the blue dots you can see that is clearly um, evident that that tab works. Uh, then, so with other layers, I will not go through all of them, but I'm just going to show you some of them. Like this land cover, actually, also have been heavily, heavily borrowed from mined from the Global Forest Watch. So you can see the intact forest. You can see the uh, primary forest, you can see the above ground land cover based on the global forest watch and the tree cover. So all this is information that you can see and further you can, this tab, once you click on something, it can give you, let me try and actually click on a spring. I don't know if it'll come. Just a moment, let me deactivate other layers. Um, time. So anyway, it's not. Uh, it's taking time, maybe because of my internet. In a further, you can actually do analysis. Your small analysis, we have an extra tab. And on that, you can select what kind of analysis that you want to do. Maybe be, uh, maybe say land cover composition. It can allow you, you can select a smaller area using this tab on your right hand side. And actually you start drawing and you select an area. Let me just try that. Anyway, sorry, uh, things are acting up. I think it's my net, but yeah, but you get the hand of it. Just based on a small area, you don't have to have all the statistics of the whole entire water tower. You can just say you want to analyze this area and it will give you a tabulated uh, graph result of whatever you're trying out of all those attributes that you're trying to analyze. Um, then we can further go to the dashboards, which equally we just had three water towers, but we hope in the future to build. So we have the, we can try the Chirangani dashboard since that's the one we've been looking at. So the, this is everything I was just saying. You can see just based on this, 
it allows you to have to analyze the annual tree cover loss of Cherengani. Equally, it can give you the carbon emission of from tree loss cover in these Cherengani water towers. Further, it can give you the water towers population statistics, the census, which we also have the population density, including the number of households. Further, we also it showcases the uh, land cover composition, the quantities, and um, also the graphical representation so that you can see the pattern and trends. So that said, I think that's all that I can uh, present right now since my net is not behaving. But if it gets better, maybe we can get back to it. So, Biko, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. <laughs> I believe everyone really enjoyed that presentation. I can see from the chat we've gotten a lot of feedback. Um, before I go to the questions, uh, I just like to remind our audience that Caroline, you know, is a senior specialist with over 10 years of experience in this field. So we're very lucky to have you taking us through this session. Um, and I can see a lot of people in the chat are thanking you for the great presentation. But we have one question uh, before I let you go from uh, Mary. Um, Mary is saying thank you for the presentation. Are there any transboundary water towers? If so, how are you coordinating with other countries as you implement the activities? Uh, and what sort of arrangements or agreements are in place? And who funds that? That's from Mary. OK. Uh, yes, we do. Like one of them is, uh, part of it is at Kilimanjaro, because most of the water, is, it's in Tanzania, which is our yeah. neighboring country. Uh, in the south and uh, yeah that's a challenge and also we have uh, Mount Elgon which we share a lot with uh, Uganda so yeah. mostly what we try is to avoid the politics of it we try and manage from our side yeah. most, most of the time but if there's need we have to go through the whole protocol which involves the policy makers and that's how we have to do a very formal way approach of it. And most of the time, yeah. most of our funding we do is government, but heavily, like you can see, this one was funded by World Resource Institute. So, okay. yeah, so mostly it's, it's, it's government plus any person who's willing. And most of the times we try and um, also sell proposals for people to come and help us because we also try and it's, co it's collaborative because remember even when we're doing this we have to work with because if it's remember if it's a mount elgon mount elgon has the mm. national park at the top of the moorland then at the yeah. towards at the slopes of the we have akfs you see now i'm telling you we always have a disjointed approach because we have mm. all these people but now then we have people, the same ecosystem, but we have KWS. Then we have, yeah. so we also try work, and that's how we come with this management plan, hoping that we'll all work together, because I know different entities, organizations have different budgets. So, but yeah. when we come with one management plan, it will help us always have this coordinated approach, and we always try and involve them. Even when we go, yeah. we use the county, we use the chiefs, we use anyone who's involved NEMA, KF, that's but yeah in terms of funding uh i can't really say because it's at times it's government at times it's non-government okay yeah. yeah i think mary i hope she's answered but she's also asking if you can is the link publicly available um can we access it yet no not yet yeah. for now because <laughs> no, yeah. for now yeah, yeah. For okay. so now, because uh, yeah, we need it needs to be officiated by the policymakers, the CS, and yeah, uh, but yeah, but the members who are the eighteen, mm. Mm. then since they're part of it, they can use it and access it. But yeah, okay. we 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 soon actually it's because of COVID, it has delayed a lot of things. But we really there was a there's meant to be a launch, and once the launch is there, it's accessible on our website and other. And all our partners. 
we, we wish you all the best. I hope that launch, uh, you'll invite some of the people who've attended here to also celebrate with you. Definitely. <laughs> they've really enjoyed the solution. Uh, one last question before I let you go, Caroline. Uh, okay. We have a question from Taita Taveta University, uh, Nahashon, uh, who's one of our ambassadors. <laughs> Nahashon, pleasure to have you here. Uh, he's asking, since the tree type is important in terms of ecology, um, conservation, and carbon sequestration, do you um, have a way of discri discriminating the tree cover types from the remote sensing technology? I hope that made sense. Uh, mm. Yes, but not very yeah. accurate. So far, mm. so far we've used just the traditional um, land cover assessment using random forest, which is a bit more advanced to the traditional. So at least we try, we try, we do like the times we've tried and pick pine, cypress in our forest mm. in Kaptagat. Uh, it's not very accurate, but we try. And also we try and differentiate from the indigenous, but it's not too accurate. But what we want to try is go through the use of LIDAR system. LIDAR system, at least you can do individual tree mapping. So maybe it will give a, a better way of an additional added value to separating and analyzing trees. Yeah, but we've tried. It works, but it's not 100%. Better than nothing, right? <laughs> yes, it's better than nothing. At least it helps yeah. with having an okay. idea of what is there. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Caroline. I think we've all enjoyed and learned a lot uh, from your session. Um, I know the audience is clapping wherever they are. Uh, stick around. I know there'll be more questions on the chat. Uh, Monica is taking note of that. Uh, but we thank you for giving us this time, Caroline. Uh, thank you for the kind words, all of you. Okay. All right. Um, so let's switch things up. Uh, we're going back to our presentation. Um, we have a technical session now from as in Africa. Um, I'll be introducing um, you to a few concepts. Uh, I know um, through the presentation that Caroline offered, you're hearing different components of, of, of our system. Uh, but I'd just like to make sure that we're all on the same page and really bring you up to speed with what Esri is doing and how we are creating and you know continuously improving on the technology that is helping serve our users from both the products um, to even the education part of things in line with our vision um, that I spoke about um, in, in, the, in the first session. So um, as Esri, we have focused on this comprehensive geospatial platform that supports multiple com communities. Uh, Kenya Water Towers has showcased how they're able to do, to do that. Um, and it's not just for the GS community, um, but also the mapping and location services, as well as the location analytics communities. Uh, this two form a key part of, of, of the data that is now being supported within our ecosystem. And ArcGIS also supports geo-enabled systems. Um, these are specialized products that use components of JS technology for focused, uh, for more focused workflows. Uh, and all of this is done in an open and developer-friendly environment with software as a service um, and even installable software. Uh, and most re recently, we've now launched a new platform as a service um, for the developer community. And ArcGIS supports three fundamental systems. Um, that's, we call them fundamental systems because essentially this is what is at the heart of, of, of uh, the geospatial infrastructure that I introduced to introduced you to earlier on in the session, uh, where we have a system of record um, which keeps all the transactional data, and a system of insight um, which now um, is able to really unlock the new understanding and the new uh, insights that you can unlock from 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 the data, and we deliver it through systems of engagement um, through applications and maps that connect people to the organization's work and help them communicate and share that information. Um, and we've seen that ArcGIS is an integrated system uh, that brings many components together and has been engineered to work as a single system supporting many kinds of applications and, and, and people. Uh, a good example we've seen is now the Kenya Water Towers Watch, and we're looking at another system um, later on in the program. And as a technology, it is what is enabling and fueling this geospatial infrastructure pattern. 
ArcGIS has, uh, as the users of ArcGIS have really leveraged um, these capabilities that it offer. And now with cloud deployments, that um, capability is now fully scalable, uh, depending on the cloud um, you know, provider that it is installed on. Um, they are extending their system and strengthening their capabilities by deploying in the cloud, like ArcGIS Enterprise, but also leveraging the software as a service resources from the cloud, like content and analytics and even imagery, uh, which we'll really touch upon uh, when we go to the next sections. And what Esri has done is to ensure that ArcGIS remains open and interoperable. Uh, we support and leverage multiple initiatives to make this happen, you know, such as the standards that have been set in place from OGC, uh, ISO, and others. ArcGIS is really designed as an open architecture with open APIs and open data so that it can help our users integrate their systems into a broader frame of the other IT systems that they may uh, be having in place. And in the sector for water, we've really seen now ArcGIS playing a huge role to enabling what we call the intelligent water system, which is now able to support the GIS all the way from the source of water um, at the top left, you know, to how the water is produced and treated, you know, how the stormwater is also collected. All these networks are now able to be modeled within ArcGIS. You know, and this really provides uh, communities with a new way of, of really understanding, uh, you know, how to manage their water resources better. And not only that, we have constantly been improving and advancing the ArcGIS uh, capabilities with lots of new innovations and specialized applications um, that we'll cover in the next few slides. First and foremost, it's all about data. Um, you know, the content that ArcGIS provides is, is, is always updated. And ArcGIS content is an integral part of the system uh, because it's ready to use, you know, meaning when you get ArcGIS, you're not starting on a blank page. You already have data sets that you can be able to now plug in and overlay with the data that you may have to really understand the, the context of what it is that you're looking at. You know, we have thousands of layers, including base maps and imagery and more, um, you know, that cover the earth. The content um, is publicly available, um, you know, and it's from public sources and it's curated by our Esri experts and made very available so that you can access and integrate into your own work. And this list on the right here shows some of the new initiatives that we've been working on, you know, with the, the different uh, agencies like NGDA. Uh, we have demographics data globally that are now being updated um, that you may find useful and apply for your own work. What I'm really excited about is the new high resolution global land cover that was recently announced by Esri. Um, you know, one part of this content is 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 a particular interest because this high resolution global cover data set is provided by Sentinel-2 satellites, you know, and is a consistent map of land cover of the entire globe based on the most current satellite information. And I know some of you might, might see this useful for your areas, um, you know, specialization. But this now open data is available to you as services or as downloads. And we built this map over the past several years in collaboration with the National Geographic Society um, and the likes of Microsoft and uh, other partners as well. In the area of uh, desktop mapping, uh, which you know some call traditional GIS, we've been able to pioneer the next level of, of desktop um, software called ArcGIS Pro, uh, which now is at the heart of, 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 our, of our solutions. And we've certainly achieved you know, the, the parity that was there with ArcMap, you know, which a, a lot more people are familiar with. And we've introduced new tools for advancing um, cartographic science. And we've also made enhancements, um, you know, based on the requests that we've gotten from our users and, you know, some of the performance capabilities that they had been requesting for. All this has been, you know, upgraded in, in the new offerings of ArcGIS Pro that, you know, you may find very useful for, for some of your work. And not only that, we've even uh, pioneered and really gone ahead to invest in the areas of interactive web mapping, um, where we made lots of improvements. Um, the example on the upper left is illustrates, uh, you know, this concept with data-driven exploration of maps, right? Uh, where now you're really able to see more from a map than before. Um, and this dynamically, it, it just shifts completely how you're able to explore patterns from a map 
you know, and this idea of interactive environment really brings home some of the areas of interest that you might be looking at when you're doing your analysis or, or some of the work that you may be doing. There's an instant apps also um, have been introduced um, within the ArcGIS system because they quickly transform any 2D or 3D map into an application that provides your audience with an intuitive experience to interact with your maps um, and data. So, you know, this is a new way of delivering, you know, some of the maps that you are delivering, but now you improve upon them and even uh, enables your users to have 3D uh, understanding. And we currently support, you know, more than a dozen of these applications with more coming. Um, and these are configurable, configurable apps that all you do is just customize towards meeting your specific needs. Dashboards have become almost an essential element of um, any GIS. And most organizations right now are seeing them, you know, providing dynamic and real-time visual reporting about virtually any subject. And dashboards have been embraced by our users to be able to provide at a glance information, um, like you know you saw from Kenya Water Towers. And we're working on adding, you know, more functionalities to the dashboards, uh, you know, to include things like tables and the ability to natively implement that on even mobile devices, and and have that, you know, really, um, you know, scale um, as as the organization scales its data sets as well. So this means that people will be able to look at their favorite dashboards anywhere, anytime. And, and on any, any device. Another powerful tool that uh, the ArcGIS system offers is story maps, you know, which changes how you're able to, you know, tell stories or report or, you know, just publish your data to your communities. And it continues to be very popular within our community. And they're opening up geographic storytelling for everyone else. You know, everybody has a story and more and more people are telling their stories. Story maps has really shown uh, why maps are important, you know, to give real context to, you know, whatever topic they're covering. Um, and there's a new introduction of a user type on ArcGIS just for storytelling. Um, and this user type has opened up the storytelling in an affordable way to entire enterprises. And we're going to continue on that journey of making this more available and easier to be used by everyone. And uh, when we look at uh, our work in the interactive visual analytics um, and how we've been able to capture this and deliver it through a product we call ArcGIS Insights, it's very easy to learn. And this tool completely changes um, how you think about uh, business intelligence or BI, because it allows for people to access lots of different data around the organization and perform exploratory, exploratory uh, visual analytics and generate interactive reports. These tools are rapidly expanding and empowering spatial and, and, and business analytics within organizations. And, and this also extends towards data science and spatial analysis. ArcGIS right now is delivering these capabilities because it's at the heart of soul of what most GIS professionals do. They're about solving problems and advancing science. And, and this year we've even added new tools and improved uh, the existing ones. Uh, and on the right, it shows some of the recent improvements that you can see uh, within the platform and also explore um, some of the new tools for artificial intelligence intelligence and machine learning um, are really now, you know, being delivered in a way that's very easy for, for our users to, to unlock that capability. When you look at imagery and report sensing as well, um, the innovations there now have been able to allow, you know, for ArcGIS to provide the key capabilities um, to enable complete workflow, workflows for gaining insights from imagery. You know, the management of the content to make it accessible. Imagery mapping, you know, is turning JS ready products and analyzing them to extract information uh, and visualize that information um, in ways that now have become even easier than before, right? The, uh, the list that, that you can look at on each of these sections uh, represents some of the work that can be done, you know, in support of these capabilities. Um, and next, I'll be talking about uh, image hosting, which means that we can now load our imagery onto ArcGIS Online and even host it in a software as a service environment. 
image hosting and analytics in the cloud now means that uh, you can upload your own imagery into ArcGIS Online and perform raster analytics or image processing in, in, in ArcGIS Online and serve it out as image or visualization services that you can integrate directly into the work that you're doing. This enables massive, massive, um, you know, image processing capabilities and Rust analytics in the cloud. And you will see that now organizations are able to embrace, you know, and enable this massive image process. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Before. Oh, okay. Um, you can see my screen. Sorry for that interruption. Can you confirm if you can see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I was talking about drone mapping, uh, uh, which is another dimension of, of what Esri is doing with um, imagery. And we support two fundamental technologies, uh, which is side scan, um, which is the cloud offering, and drone to map, which is on the desktop. Um, and these technologies are now simplifying workflows to process, you know, drone imagery and, and support, you know, planning and managing and collecting imagery uh, and then processing it. So this is what we're beginning to call reality capture within the ArcGIS system. Next, uh, I wanted to touch on uh, the real-time capabilities that ArcGIS offers. Uh, and this is a new dimension of the work that we're doing um, and it's integrated real visualization and analytics into ArcGIS, you know, it's a um, and this is now delivered directly into ArcGIS, and we have two solutions for that, you know, first one being G-Event, and another one most recent called Velocity, which is delivered through ArcGIS Online. Um, and all this data is ingested and, and visualized in real time, and you able to now create dynamic applications, um, you know, that support various, um, you know, kind of solutions that the organization might want to be, you know, innovating. For many of you, you know, data management and editing uh, forms a key part of the work that you're doing. Um, here, uh, our activities include continuing to advance the tools, workflows, and data models, and to integrate them with all the leading data management technologies, in a, whether it's in the cloud or on-premise. You know, looking towards the future, we'll be integrating ArcGIS with the cloud data warehouses to enrich and do, you know, things like big data analysis and other types of operations. So we're continuing to support, you know, and advance industry data models. Um, we have one for utilities, which is called the utility network model um, that has simplified um, a lot of the work for electric and communications and water and gas companies. And we've seen some of those models being adopted within the region. Um, and these improvements also go to even towards the geodatabases, um, you know, where we've seen improvements in performance, um, in the attribute rules, um, and all this is geared towards improving the workflows, um, you know, for our users and advancing the, the tools that we offer them. In the area of um, field operations and data collection, uh, Caroline touched on a bit on how they're able to, you know, utilize some of our field applications and actually this really provides a full suite of field applications that innovation that we introduced last year was the ArcGIS field map. 
uh, field maps uh, application that brought together the capabilities of many of the individual uh, products that we used to have before uh, that some of you made me familiar with uh, but now puts it in one application for collecting data updating data in the fields tracking mobile workers and being able to access service-based uh, visualizations so this really gives you an operational awareness for people uh, who are supporting you know the co-workers in the fields and, and and really unlocks a lot of efficiency and productivity for for the organization and lastly uh, one of our recent uh, developments like i mentioned was delivering uh, actjs through a platform as a service uh, where we have the ActJS platform, you know, and this was released early in this year, and it's delivered as platform as a service uh, for the developer community, for them to really access Esri's location services using their APIs of choice, um, including open source APIs, and it allows developers to create applications and extend the capabilities of ActJS, um, you know, through APIs and SDKs. Um, but it's also com consumption based, so they only pay for what they use in terms of the services. Uh, so ActJS platform is really geared towards, you know, embedding these location services into enterprise systems. So right now, I'd like to invite uh, Sidney Nyongesa, who's been supporting a lot of our customers uh, in this industry um, to unlock uh, the power of ActJS. So Sydney will be showing us a brief example of, of how one of our web application works in helping us analyze floods um, within this sector. Sydney, you can take over. Uh, thank you, Biko. Thank you for that uh, nice presentation. <coughs> uh, my name is Sydney Simiu, and I support Esri in the natural resource uh, sector. And I'm going to show you uh, how ArcGIS as a system has come in a strong way to actually try and uh, 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 map, uh, map out the development challenges and provide also solutions towards uh, achieving a, a better world. So um, reflecting on, uh, let me just share my screen. I hope that's visible. So uh, reflecting on, uh, on our theme, uh, which is uh, reflecting on resilience, specifically on how to map uh, development challenges and also solutions for a better world. Uh, Esri has, uh, has, uh, uh, has come in a strong way uh, to actually promote mapping that promotes that actually uh, improves understanding of where where actually uh, what is where uh, how much is uh, involved and what is at stake in actually making it possible to unlock uh, information about any changes in the system and uh, possible impact scenarios brought about these system changes. So for my demonstration, I'm actually going to show you the solutions that uh, Esri uh, has come up with uh, to actually enable us uh, uh, solve the solutions, that, to solve the problems that are uh, impact uh, caused by, by floods. Uh, one, of the, one of the key elements of uh, uh, floods is uh, actually be able to map uh, uh, flood plane analysis to come to conduct a flood plane analysis and a risk assessment and all this risk assessment is uh, what in what is involved is uh, being able to conduct a hazard identification and assessment uh, whereby we now be, we now are able to determine the maximum in inundation and depths of rivers uh, maximum flood velocities, duration of inundations, and frequencies of these inundations. Also, uh, another aspect to flood management is be able to conduct a vulnerability assessment and determine uh, what, what uh, facilities, what uh, uh, population is actually at risk 
of being affected by these uh, floods. And part of this vulnerability analysis involved uh, uh, social economic and development levels and being able to determine uh, which, infrastructural, which infrastructural uh, facilities are, are at risk and, and also being able to discover and map them out. So uh, ArcGIS helps customers in address many of these uh, aspects of flood management. And one of these uh, is through the online platform that actually that Esri has developed and come up with. Uh, this now uh, is able to harness, uh, to be able to bring up, to collect and uh, aggregate all data from remote sensing uh, sources, uh, spatial data and attribute data into one, into one uh, uh, database as a system of record and being able to have a central place, place whereby you can now be able to come up with insights on uh, how to tackle the, how to, you can actually conduct these uh, assessments. So one of these uh, aspects is, uh, uh, is being able to, to see, uh, sorry, uh, can you hear me? Am yes, I, am I audible? Okay. Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, one of these uh, aspects involved uh, collecting data and, uh, and uh, Esri has developed some of these data that have, that some of these application that enable us uh, and also the customers as well to be able to go to the field and collect this data. For instance, you need to, to map out uh, uh, maybe the da damage assessment and uh, being able to conduct uh, to determine uh, the depths of these uh, flood plains. So one of those apps is, uh, is the survey, is the survey one to three apps whereby you're able to conduct, uh, to develop uh, survey forms and be able to actually uh, uh, conduct the, uh, social, the vulnerability analysis and, uh, sorry, and uh, being able to, uh, carry out these surveys, for instance, in the, in the population that has been affected, you're able to map out and determine what, what social economic aspect has, uh, what impact do they have uh, from, this, from these floods. Uh, another thing, uh, if I could uh, probably go to the next slide, the next slide is to show you the various uh, products that you are able to develop from the ArcGIS system, uh, whether it's the flood impact analysis, uh, you are able to develop apps that are able to actually visualize, uh, for instance, uh, these uh, impacts and also determine, uh, be able to design effect and implement effective solutions. Uh, over to the next slide. I'm going to show you some of these products that uh, Esri has developed. If I could just stop this and share. Let me just share another slide. Uh, just, just a brief demonstration is to show you how uh, we can map we can map out this vulnerability and able to determine the location of where where actually uh, the critical infrastructure are and uh, what what impact would they have uh, for instance if they occurred now so you, using ArcGIS system to manage flood flood planning response and mitigation allows for easy visualization at every level uh, of the planning stage and also allow every member of an organization or local partners access information they need to actually make uh, effective decision. So uh, for instance, if you look at the map that I've shared, uh, we, are actually to be, we are actually able to determine uh, what critical infrastructures, for instance, are able to be, can, can be affected uh, if there is a low, low, uh, low 
low level uh, flood or to, to a high level uh, flood risk area, you're able to map out what extent are these uh, uh, assets able to be, can be affected. So for instance, here we have a train station as a critical public infrastructure, and you're able to locate where each, each uh, infrastructure is located and at what, at what extent will these floods actually affect this uh, type of infrastructure. On the left side, you can see the level of uh, flooding risk, uh, which ranges from very low to high. And uh, on, on the map view, you can see that the, 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 high, the high, high flooding uh, level is on the deep, deeper blue shade. And you can see the, where the, for instance, uh, we have this Ponoma station which shows that there's a low flood, flood risk uh, that's likely to happen for uh, if, if the, the, flood, the flood is likely to occur. Uh, in any location can experience flooding, but most locations lack predictive uh, miles to tell what the next flood event would look like. So how we, how we do this plane and respond to this event? The first step is to prepare for flooding and know what the flood areas look like and always try to mitigate that threat. In the map we present, uh, in the map that I'm, I'm, I'm showing you, you can see uh, uh, for this extent, you're able to see, uh, when, once you conduct the vulnerability assessment, you can uh, tie this data to the, for instance, the population data and actually able to predict what kind of uh, population within this area is likely to be affected. That will inform the social, economic and vulnerability as analysis and be able now to make uh, improved decision, uh, for instance, on evacuation uh, strategies and also uh, provide uh, uh, alternative routes. For instance, if you are planning on providing al alternative routes to for instance, in evacuation, you can now uh, use this map to gain deeper insights. Uh, let me share uh, another screen. I don't know whether you can you can you can see. Uh, could you confirm, please, if you can see my my next yes, tab? Can. Yeah, we can. Yeah, uh, Biko mentioned uh, how story maps can be used to communicate uh, uh, stories and actually uh, be able to uh, explain uh, and uh, give uh, deeper insights on what, uh, what analysis uh, is able to come up with. Uh, for instance, uh, the flood management with ArcGIS, we are, we are able to see that floods can actually be a costly uh, disaster, but with the ArcGIS system, with the proper planning and uh, proper planning, we are able now, uh, with the organization, we are able now to, uh, to have proper strategies to uh, mitigate this, uh, these disasters. Uh, Uh, in this map, uh, we have, uh, it's, it's the FEMA, FEMA flood map, where, which shows a plane, a flood plane. And this plane, uh, you can see from the legend, we have some layers. Uh, that's the letter, of, the letter of map amendment, which actually describes uh, points that have, uh, which actually described uh, points where people have tried to mitigate floods uh, earlier. And uh, we also have a letter of map revision. Let me just zoom out a bit. We are able to, to incorporate imagery and actually conduct more, uh, gain deeper insights on how we can have this uh, uh, a system to inform our decisions on on the type of uh, the kind of uh, strategy that we need to undertake. For instance, we could have uh, you could map out the parcels, the land parcels that are likely to be affected, and the type of land use that could be 
that could be also be within the zone, the flood, the flood zone, and the type of uh, activities that are likely to be affected with this kind of floods. Uh, in the next, in the next uh, map, uh, we have an. Uh, this is the ArcGIS online system, uh, whereby whereby we are able to see the level the level of uh, uh, the level of flood uh, and what you are seeing here is the flood inundation stage for a place in california and this this data is actually tied to the national weather service uh, action in the united states and uh, you can also have the ability to zoom into the map and identify for instance, this is one of the rasters that has been processed to show the different levels of the different flood levels uh, that uh, have been modeled. For instance, in here, uh, what, what you can see on the map is a flood level of 15 foot stage. And you can see the extent on which it covers. And within, within this extent, you are able now to see uh, what kind of uh, facilities are able to be uh, to be are at risk of being affected by this uh, event. So uh, if I click, you're able now, uh, let me just see if it responds, but you're able to see uh, the inundation depth uh, at, a, at a certain point. For instance, if I try and click uh, on this section, uh, sorry, uh, my, I think it's taking time to respond, but uh, this this information can be presented uh, in a three D view, also uh, in a in a scene viewer three D three D scene viewer within ArcGIS online system that uh, you can able to get to have a three D view uh, of the flood plane and uh, the extent of the where where the risk is likely to occur. Uh, for instance, here we have uh, on the map, we have uh, a five foot above record stage that shows the extent where by if the flood, uh, if the depth uh, is uh, at five foot, what, what extent and what type of, what infrastructures are likely to be affected with this kind of, uh, uh, with this uh, kind of uh, a flood. Uh, I hope the system is responsive enough. Uh, maybe if I could just click and show you how the different uh, visualization uh, that are able to occur in within a 3D view, uh, you are able to pan and uh, move across uh, and, 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 and glide across uh, the plane and have that uh, 3D visualization to actually gain deeper insights on uh, and give you an idea of the flood depths uh, this data can be improved because uh, uh, most of these uh, uh, rasters are developed from the terrain, uh, digital elevation models, and uh, LIDAR, LIDAR data, and this could be used to improve uh, this, uh, this type of analysis. Uh, this, al this allows you to look at what the predicted stream value of the stream is going to be, along with the past uh, flood values. For instance, uh, maybe if, if I could try and click to see if it's responsive enough. So this is a 35 foot flood stage and you can see uh, it's, it's rendering, but you can see the extent, the extent at which the flood has, uh, has, uh, has, has spread and this, and you can you are able now to visualize with the imagery uh, overlay you are able to visualize the type of infrastructure that's likely to be affected with uh, such kind of uh, a flood flood event uh, if i if i glide over to the next map uh, this this is a stage warning map uh 
this this map shows um uh, this map shows uh uh the weather 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 data and which is which is which is really important in uh, informing us uh uh whether weather data is important in uh, this flood flood analysis uh if uh, if if i zoom close to 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 this kind of to this type or uh, to this town you you hello can you can you hear me yes we can Hello. Go ahead, Sydney. We can hear okay, you. Okay, 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 okay. So uh, this this map uh, shows uh, the weather weather data that uh, is really important in informing us uh, where where floods are likely to occur and which areas are are in high risk of having uh, floods. Uh, this is a this is an United States map. Uh, which is uh, which contains data that has been sourced from the national national uh, weather service uh, station uh, of the USGS, and uh, with this you are able to see you are able to model the rivers uh, at different uh, uh, time and able now to plug in weather data. For instance, uh, we have the short term weather warnings uh, that is provided as a raster and also. You're able to see uh, uh, to get a flood, the flash flash floods warning uh, if it's the type of flood, uh, or also the long term floods. For instance, if I zoom in to one of the point, one of the areas here, uh, there you're able now to see uh, stream gauges. For instance, if I click on this uh, on this point here, you can see that we have uh, information. Uh, on this on this stream here, which shows uh, different uh, which shows uh, different uh, stream levels and height gauge heights at different times of the of the of the uh, different times of the month, and with this you are able now to to actually predict uh, at what level uh, these floods are, will will likely to occur. So uh, the next the next uh, map is to actually uh, uh, have an impact analysis, and this is a vulnerability analysis to actually understand uh, what type of uh, what type of demographic uh, uh, population is likely to be affected uh, with this kind of floods. Uh, for instance, uh, at at uh, twenty stage uh, twenty foot stage uh, flood risk. If I if I could just zoom at the 20 stage flood risk, you're able to see the the population. For instance, this is the 2015 uh, population uh, data from the uh, Bureau of uh, the U.S. Bureau of uh, Census, and you're able to see the the demographic uh, uh, properties. For in, uh, for instance, here we have uh, the seniors. Uh, which which uh, it shows the number of seniors that are likely to be affected by this uh, flood flood event, the households with disabilities, and also the average income per per household within that uh, uh, twenty foot uh, uh, flood event. So with this kind of uh, map, you are able to gain insights and also plan uh, plan your uh, your emergency strategies. Uh, if I glide also to the next map, this map shows uh, the the type of infrastructure that is also likely to be uh, affected by such a, such a happening, such an event. Uh, with with flood with flood events, you you want to understand uh, what what infrastructure, what public infrastructure will be affected. Uh, when it when 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 uh, for instance a uh, flood of a certain depth uh, occurs, and uh, with the ArcGIS system, ArcGIS online system, you are able to actually map out 
uh, exactly what uh, which which facilities are likely to be affected for instance in in this map i have a 30 foot stage uh, uh, a flood flood model uh, with a buffer buffer zone over 35 uh, uh, foot and you're able to see for instance if i click on this uh, infrastructure here you can see it's a hydrant and you you are able now to determine what exact which number uh, which amount of uh, which of which number of facilities and ex exact uh, where where they are located that, that are going to be affected by this uh, this flood event so uh, with this now you are able to conduct uh, further analysis for instance uh, with this simple app you are able to configure it and get the exact you are able to extract the exact features and actually determine uh, what what strategies are you going to take in order to to cover uh, to try and reduce uh, the risk uh, associated with flood on these uh, particular uh, facilities so uh, with the next map uh, this shows uh, the collector, the field collecting apps that are able now, to, that are able, you are able now to go and uh, collect uh, to the on the field and determine, uh, for instance, if it's a damage assessment uh, survey, you are able to go to the field and actually get to a uh, map out uh, what extent of the damage has occurred, uh, for instance, in a in a in a certain uh, facility. For instance, here we have a. Uh, we have a debris that has been downed. Uh, that uh, it's a it's a downed tree in a river, and you're able to actually connect and uh, see. Sorry, this a uh, different picture. <laughs> sorry, sorry for that. But uh, with, you can see, you you get you get the idea that uh, without you are able now to hyperlink that uh, on the ArcGIS online system, and be able to actually uh, tag those uh, debris and uh, facilities exactly, and which will now be informed which will now also inform, for instance, if it's a reconstruction, a reconstruction effort and recovery effort, uh, what extent are you going to repair and uh, which kind of uh, uh, strategy are you going to employ, for instance, in planning for the for subsequent uh, flood happenings? Uh, so uh, with that short uh, demo, it's just to demonstrate uh, how uh, the ArcGIS online uh, platform as a, as a system is able to, to, is able to, to, is able, is, is able to uh, support uh, efforts in uh, conducting uh, this uh, flood, uh, flood events and also develop a, a, resi a, a resilient, uh, a resilient uh, mitigation, mitigating uh, strategy. Uh, thank you, thank you for that, Biko. Yeah, thank you, Sydney. That was great. Uh, I'm sure our audience has really enjoyed <laughs> what you've shared. Um, I'm seeing that uh, there's not questions, but uh, can you stick around? Because we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So I hope uh, our audience will be able to collect their questions and ask you at the end um, in the interest of time. But thank you so much, Sydney. Um, that was a great uh, demo. Um, allow me to just quickly go back to our program. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Sydney. Um, as we move along, uh, we have one more presentation um, left. Um, and that's from our one of our key clients um, from Kodio East Africa, who go with James Bogua. So James Bogua is a project manager and GIS uh, officer at Kodio East Africa, and he has a lot of experience in spatial analysis and interpretation of earth observation products. Um, so I'd like for us to go into his presentation. Unfortunately, he is not able to join us today, but we recorded his presentation um, to be able to ensure that it runs smoothly. Um, so we'll go through James's presentation and then we'll take the questions for both Sydney and, and what you will have to ask in regards to James's presentation um, after this in our Q&A um, session. So next will be James from Kodio East Africa speaking on uh, enhancing 
enhancing coastal and marine resilience in the Western Indian Ocean. And this will enable you to see now the other side of, of, of uh, this management, which is the insights from marine spatial planning and marine biodiversity. Um, and James is really going to be able to showcase how he's able to develop uh, things like coral bleach alert system and the maintenance of the regional uh, database uh, for marine. So let's go into the presentation. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining, uh, uh, offering your time to come and listen to for what we're presenting and how we've been using the S3 applications to, the manage, to manage our marine resources. Um, myself, I'm James Mbogwa. I'm a project manager at Koryo East Africa. That's coastal oceans and research in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and uh, I'm a GIS and IT expert. So in this um, uh, presentation, I'll be showcasing uh, uh, what we've been doing across the, the region. And my topic is titled Enhancing Coastal and Marine Resilience in the Western Indian Ocean, of course, with an insight for marine spatial planning and marine biodiversity conservation. So to, to, to start with, so I'll just highlight my uh, the, the presentation overview. So I'll talk about Cordio in uh, uh, brief details and then we look at the Western Indian Ocean perspective, threats facing the coastal and marine environment, uh, some of the solutions that we have tried to provide or intervene. And here yeah, I'll look at some for outputs and products. Then I'll pause a bit and uh, give uh, the floor time for reaction and some question and answer before proceeding to the services and wrap up. So to begin with, Cordium East Africa is a research organization. We are, it was initiated in 1999, and our main focus is on marine and coastal ecosystem in the Western Indian Ocean. So as much as our focus is on coral reefs, so we, we also have a broad context, which include the ecology and resilience, long-term monitoring, artisanal and small-scale fisheries, and things to do with climate change and sustainable development of the uh, uh, blue economy. So our, our region of engagement is the Western Indian Ocean. You will hear more about Western Indian Ocean. I'll be referring to this. But since 1999, we've been in operation for 20 years, and we have actually have uh, our footprints around the Red Sea, the East African region. We've also implemented some project in the Andaman Sea and the Southeast Asia. So well, just to move forward and tell you about the Western Indian Ocean region. So few readers will have heard about the term Western Indian Ocean region. And yet this uh, space is home to 60, key kilo, to 60 million people living within the uh, 10 East African and South African countries. So the map on the right shows the, the Western Indian Ocean region. So we have 10 countries uh, from Somalia to South Africa and then far east up to the Comoros and the, uh, the Mauritius. And so this is where actually our focus and research is is, is focusing on. So the, the places I've mentioned is, six, uh, is home to 60 million people living within a hundred kilometer stretch. So it's quite a, a, an area that is inhabited by so many people that are drawing their, uh, the, the, their livelihoods from the ocean. So in 2017, we, there was a, a groundbreaking report. So we initiated a uh, a study that actually placed the Western Indian Ocean region as an asset and it placed at a value of uh, around 300 billion US dollars. So despite this enormous wealth and uh, enormous wealth and benefits, the health of the Western Indian Ocean asset is in real jeopardy. So uh, looking at this as an ocean in peril, so the growing human population has increased the demand for both food and space. And our oceans are now being overexploited and polluted. 
threatening these fragile ecosystems. So as you can see on the, the, the image on the right, just showcase some facts that we found from the study. So the over 60 million people living on this area have exerted a lot of pressure. And this has resulted in shrinking of ecosystems, including mangrove. You can see around 18% of the mangrove have declined since 1980 to around 2010. Well, we also are also experiencing challenges in terms of coral reefs. Uh, so there is risk of bleaching, uh, actually occasioned by climate change that has also resulted in the increase in the pH, uh, the salinity of the ocean and sea level rise that has again has a, an impact on the marine life. So the, the demand for food, on the other hand, has also led to the, to the situation whereby the resources of this region are being uh, overexploited. So looking at this scenario, you realize that there is a lot that needs to be done. And unless there is effective management plans, so these uh, resources might, uh, the Western Indian Ocean might cease to produce the, the resources, all the benefits that uh, people will depend on. So on my next slide, I'll just show some key highlights. So about the, on the region. So the current declines in ocean assets and future population and economic growth so provide a profound challenge to the blue economy of the future. So the, the, the blue economy is at the core of the African Union and individual countries' aspiration for development led by the ocean. I'm sure most of you have heard about the blue economy. So this is something that the regional government are trying to tap the wealth of this ocean and make it um, to, to drive the, 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 the national development at large. So um, with this, also the key, another key is that the ocean can no longer be viewed as a limitless space with free access for all. So you find that uh, with the increase in population, like I mentioned earlier, so there has been great demand for space and food. So there is a lot of competing interest in the ocean. And unlike the, 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 the land use plan, where we have uh, uh, some guidelines on how we can manage the space on land, there is a lack of marine spatial plan across the region, not only in Kenya. And this has created a lot of um, conflicts uh, around this, the management and utilization of these, uh, this resource. So it, it therefore begs that the ocean needs to be managed over its entirety and come to a balance uses that don't undermine the productivity and many benefits that it provides. So on the right, there is again, I'm referring to the Western Indian Ocean Economy Report that I highlighted before. And uh, you can find the, this uh, report, on, I've provided the link below. So yeah, it gives a, a depth insight of what challenges, of what the, the, the values that the Western Indian Ocean is capable of supporting and the livelihoods of that. So in this case, you can just refer to that link and see what else other information that you can find from that. So in my next slide, I'll just try and showcase the interventions that we've we've done. And uh, so the, the current declines in assets, as I've mentioned, uh, foreshadow significant challenges in the absence of conservation measures. So as a research organization, our core mandate is only anchored in our vision, which is to generate and share scientific and sound knowledge with a mission to to supporting to, to see a healthy coastal marine environment. So we've been uh, working on research, so research extensively across the region, and we have a lot of publications that we've done. And uh, so, yeah, so, so, so all in um, with an effort of making sure that we generate the, the information that is required to make the 
my informed decision when it comes to the management of marine resources. So in my next slide, I will highlight some uh, examples of intervention that has a, has a with a special perspective. So in short, how we've applied GIS and S3 products to, to, to aid in the management of marine resources. Yeah, so you might have heard about the quote from, I think, Jack Benjamont, I think it's the uh, CEO of S3. And he once quoted that the application of GIS is only limited by the imagination of those who use it. So what I'm showcasing here is it's a map and it's actually uh, yeah, a, a literature review. So it's just showing you the, so some literature that we reviewed and how we mapped those studies where they have been done. And this has been actually been uh, published as a paper and it, yeah, it's also contributing again to the world of knowledge within the region. So the, the key highlight here is that you, you, you are not limited to, to, to how you can use the application. So there are so many ways. It depends on how imagine, imaginative you are or how creative you are with the, with the application. Yeah, in my next slide, Again, here I present an overview, uh, example of research intervention again. So this is a, a study that we did and I used uh, the uh, S3 application that is ArcGIS and Envy to do image classification for Lalane and Kuya, Kuya region in Northern Mozambique. So here we were just mapping marine habitats and we wanted to do an integrated assessment of coastal fisheries for Mozambique for conservation planning purposes. So this is a paper that again has received a lot of citations and yeah, we are happy that we managed to contribute to, to, to that knowledge kind of uh, at that level. Uh, again, I present another uh, uh, example of what we've done with the SNE application. So this is basically using the marine geospatial ecological tools. It's uh, an extension tool that is uh, free. It's open source, but you can on, you integrate it with ArcGIS. So what you see here in this scheme, uh, I'm showing coral reef uh, naval dispersion. So it's a simulation model and it shows from the images that you see, it was a simulation that was that trained for 11 days. So here I'm just hoping that you can see my casa. I have the, the, the initial time when the, uh, when, when this, the, the, the larvae are being dispersed. So larvae here is treated as dye, concentrated initially at reefs. So on my, the first image here, you can see the dark color. So all those are larvae, so this is the zero. And we ran this model for 11 days. So here I've just showcased up to the three, but the last image now shows the day 11. And the, the simulation progresses the, through output of simulation uh, kind of a time series, and you can see how far the the larvae are, the coral reef larvae are dispersed throughout the region within 11 days. So this is just a, a highlight, and what tries to show is that we are able to simulate uh, areas that can uh, either the source and the the. the the destination of larvae, how they are distributed. So in this case, for instance, if you check in the, this last image, you can see after 11 days, we have, the larvae have spread all over the Western Indian Ocean region, but you can see some hotspots developing around the Northern Mozambique region here. So in this case, we are able to identify areas that needs to be conserved or hot biodiversity hotspots. Yeah, so uh, I again now move to another intervention that we've done. So uh, with the um, help of, again, with GIS tools, we've managed to create 
temperature regions. So this is um, an output derived from SSD, that's a CC surface temperature statistics. So we combine data from May 2003 to 2009 to develop what we call climatic regions within the ocean, within the Western Indian Ocean region. So these are uh, basically to aid us or to help us in, the, in prediction and development of coral bleaching alert that we do each and every year since 2009. So here we do monitor the ocean during our summer season and issue bleaching alert warning to the to, to our users or stakeholders on the ground to try as much as possible to respond to any threats of coral bleaching emanating from uh, increase in temperature but in this case what they're supposed to do is just to to make sure that they avert any local stressors like overfishing or runoff from the from land so with this kind of analysis we managed to identify five SST regions or zones identified as shown on my diagram far on the far right. So this has been quite useful in identifying areas that are threatened by future climate changes and sea heat waves. And we've been able to use this and convert it into a service that we are now having as real-time observations on, on sea surface temperature and coral bleaching warnings. Again, um, I also here is a, a model that we developed for a policy brief for Mombasa. So here we are just trying to simulate sea level rise and identify hotspot areas that are prone to flooding either by an increase of sea water sea level rise by one meter. So one meter, two meter, so it's a graduated kind of presentation whereby you can see some hotspot areas. And this was actually an insight uh, written by our director, Dr. David Dobura, and it tries to illustrate the challenges faced by many coastal cities within the, the region. Below here, we try to map, it's a, a, a hotel that was just next to our office. And so it's just a, an indication of how some of these areas like highlighted there around. So it's around Bamburi around here. So this building here, it's a hotel that was actually eroded by sea erosion and wave. And yeah, so it's kind of a, a, a real example of how some of these hotspots have been identified and showcased. Yeah, so uh, um, I think I've been too fast and I'd like to pause for. Hey, uh, I hope uh, you are able to follow through that presentation. Um, I paused it because it was going into the question and answer session, which is coming in next. Uh, but I hope you're able to really get a good understanding of, of how GIS has been able to really help Kodio uh, with the marine spatial analysis that you've seen. And even they've been able to contribute towards research papers that are now leading, um, you know, the industry into understanding some of the effects of, you know, the sea level rise and even coral breaching like you've seen. So, ladies and gentlemen, that, that was our second um, presentation from one of our key customers. Um, at this point, um, I'd like for us to, you know, interact. Um, I'm sure we've covered a lot of things. It's now coming to 5 p.m. Um, here in Nairobi. Uh, we have 30 minutes left, and we saw it fit to ensure that we reserve enough time for questions and answers. Um, so you may feel free to place your questions um, on the chat or um, you can unmute yourself. Um, we have Sydney here who presented. Um, if you have any questions for him or, or if any other panelist who's spoken, kindly feel free to now engage. Monica, um, at this point, I'd like to invite you back as my co-host. <laughs> Um, you can moderate this part um, as we see what our audience thinks about the presentations and, and even uh, next steps for some of them. Okay. Thank you, Vico, for a good job. And um, 
as you've heard from Biko, you're free to unmute yourself and ask any question that you could be having or a comment. You're most welcome. Or you can raise up your hand and then we will uh, see and welcome you. 